M S W Media. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Tuesday, October 24th, 2023. Today, two more hostages have been released by Hamas. More information about what Donald Trump told the Australian billionaire Anthony Pratt. Democrats are seeking a classified briefing on whether the chaos in the Republican House helps China. Intelligence shows that Iranian-backed militias are ready to ramp up their attacks on U.S. forces in the Middle East. An 8-billion-year-old radio signal has reached Earth. And today on Yacht Cops, the U.S. Department of Justice moves to seize a $300 million superyacht owned by a Russian oligarch. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Hey, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Thank you all so much for listening while Dana is out. I appreciate your support and I appreciate our patrons supporting independent media. You can support us there by going to patreon.com slash Mueller. She wrote, uh, I do miss Dana. Also, she will be back soon. I promise. Uh, but today I'll be joined by Palm Beach County State Attorney, my friend, Dave Ehrenberg. We're going to have a big chat in the second segment of the show. Every time I speak to him, I walk away smarter for it. So I'm looking forward to that discussion. Then, of course, we will have the listener submitted good news. You can send it to us by going to dailybeanspod.com and clicking on contact. Okay, we have a ton of news to get to today. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right, first up from Richard Engel at NBC. Hamas has released two more hostages Monday, likely bringing relief to families who were desperate for their return, but leaving hundreds of people in agony over the fate of more than 200 more people who remain captive. The two hostages were identified as Nurit Cooper and Yosheved Lifshitz. In in a statement on Telegram, the military wing of Hamas said it had decided to release the two women for compelling humanitarian reasons. NBC News has not confirmed images of the hostages being released, but video broadcast on Egyptian state television showed the women on stretchers inside ambulances speaking with people who appeared to be healthcare workers. The ambulances appeared to be near the Rafah crossing on Gaza's southern border with Egypt. The International Committee of the Red Cross said it had facilitated the release of the two captives and transported them out of Gaza on Monday night local time. Quote, we hope they will soon be back with their loved ones. The humanitarian organization said that in a statement posted on social media. The announcement comes three days after the release of two Americans who had been held captive by Hamas in the Gaza Strip, Judith Raynan and her teenage daughter, Natalie. They are related to former Israel-based NBC News correspondent Martin Fletcher. At least 212 people have been taken hostage by Hamas after terrorists attacked Israel on October 7th, killing more than 1,000 people, according to Israeli Defense Force spokesman Daniel Hagari. Israel and Hamas have been at war since, and Israel's retaliatory airstrikes in Gaza have killed at least 5,087 people as of Monday morning. That's according, though, to the Palestinian Ministry of Health. Hamas says it does not have custody of all the hostages and that some were taken captive by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, another militant group based in Gaza. Israel has demanded the release of everyone who was kidnapped on October 7th. Hamas has said it will free its captives only when Israeli airstrikes in Gaza come to a halt. The hostage crisis has roiled Israel and stunned people around the world. The rapidly deteriorating conditions in Gaza have stoked international concerns about a major humanitarian crisis, with many groups accusing Israel of breaching international law by exercising collective punishment. The Hostages and Missing Families Forum An organization formed in the wake of the brutal October 7th attack said in a statement that it welcomed the safe return of Cooper and Lifshitz, as well as their upcoming reunification with loved ones. Quote, we are determined to achieve our goal, the release of all the hostages. That's what the group added. Hundreds are still in the hands of a ruthless terrorist organization, among them babies, mothers, fathers, elderly and soldiers who are all waiting for their safe return. And in a related story from Natasha Bertrand at CNN, the U.S. has intelligence that Iranian-backed militia groups are planning to ramp up attacks against U.S. forces in the Middle East as Iran seeks to capitalize on the backlash in the region to U.S. support for Israel. That's according to multiple U.S. officials. The militia groups have already launched multiple drone attacks on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. 
But the U.S. now has specific intelligence that those same groups could escalate even further as the war between Israel and Hamas continues. There are, quote, red lights flashing everywhere. That's what a U.S. official in the region told CNN. Officials said that at this point, Iran appears to be encouraging the groups rather than explicitly directing them. One official said Iran is providing guidance to the militia groups that it will not be punished by not getting resupplied with weaponry, for example, if they continue to attack U.S. or Israeli targets. On Monday, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said there is, quote, a very direct connection between these groups and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And he said the U.S. is deeply concerned about the potential of any significant escalation of these attacks in the days ahead. A senior defense official echoed that concern on Monday, quote, we see a prospect for much more significant escalation against U.S. forces and personnel in the near term. And let's be clear about it. The road leads back to Iran. Iran funds, arms, equips and trains militias and proxy forces all across the region. We are preparing for this escalation, both in terms of defending our forces and being prepared to respond decisively. Iran supports a number of proxy militia groups in countries across the region through the IRGC Quds Force. That's uh, And Tehran does not always exert perfect command and control over these groups. How willing those groups are to act independently is a, quote, persistence intelligence gap. And that's what one source noted to CNN. But Kirby said, we know that Iran is closely monitoring these events and in some cases actively facilitating attacks and spurring on others who may want to exploit the conflict for their own good, he said. Iran's goal is to maintain some plausible deniability here, but we're not going to allow them to do that, unquote. Asked by CNN on Monday whether Iran is directing the groups, State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said whether they're directing them or they're not, these are militias that they have sponsored and that they are responsible for. A senior State Department official separately told CNN that the U.S. and its partners are, quote, all on the same page, that sending a clear message to Iran that it should not seek to take advantage of the situation and groups that are under its control or influence should not seek to take advantage of this either. And if Tehran does so, that could have very escalatory and dire consequences. It's not just a U.S. message, the official said. It's a shared message. Qatar has been a key intermediary between the U.S. and its allies in Iran. That's according to multiple officials. In the case of the recent drone attacks on bases housing U.S. forces, quote, Iran is certainly more culpable than in the case of Hamas attack on Israel. That's another person familiar with the intelligence. CNN previously reported that Iranian government officials appeared caught off guard by the Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th. Iranian proxy forces have attacked bases housing U.S. troops in the past, and the U.S. has responded with airstrikes against the group's infrastructure, including as recently as March. But another source said that right now the Iranians' appetite for expanding the conflict is high. The risk tolerance is high. The U.S., meanwhile, is actively bolstering its defenses in light of the heightened threats. The U.S. has around 2,500 troops in Iraq and around 900 in Syria as part of the anti-ISIS coalition. And Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said in a statement over the weekend he was deploying additional air defense systems to the region in response to recent escalations by Iran and its proxy forces across the Middle East. Those include a terminal high altitude area defense missile system and additional Patriot batteries. Two drones targeting U.S. forces in Syria were shot down Monday and troops in Iraq and Syria faced three separate drone attacks last week from suspected Iranian proxy groups. The Pentagon confirmed this. And last Thursday, we know the U.S. Navy warship operating off the coast of Yemen intercepted multiple missiles fired by Iranian-backed Houthi militants and that they appeared to be heading toward Israel. In Tehran, there does not appear to be a clear consensus about what approach to take to the war between Israel and Hamas. And there's a quote, I'm sure there are different voices in their system advocating different things. That's what the senior department official said. And another official said, while it's unlikely that Iran would be willing to engage in the direct fighting with Israel or the U.S., directing proxies to attack U.S. assets in the Middle East allows Iran to maintain their influence and reputation while kind of having plausible deniability, right? Managing escalation risks. That's that's their way. That's how they do. So we're looking at that. Um, we've got carrier groups in the region. We just sent another one. So we'll keep an eye on it for you. Um, next up from John Allen at NBC, a group of House Democrats is asking top U.S. intelligence officials to arrange a classified briefing for Congress on how China is taking advantage of dysfunction in Washington by Republicans. 
as they struggle to elect a speaker and the government inches closer to shutting down. In a letter Monday to the National Intelligence Director Avril Haines and CIA Director William Burns that was shared first with NBC News, Democrats on the Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party wrote that Beijing is using chaos in the capital as a propaganda tool. They cited reports in Chinese media outlets as evidence. Quote, Therefore, we respectfully request a classified briefing from the U.S. intelligence community, the IC, on how the CCP and our foreign adversaries are leveraging current political dysfunction in the U.S. House of Representatives to discredit democracy globally in their efforts to promote an alternative authoritarian model of governance internationally, enhance their ability to form economic and national security alliances, and harm our standing with strategic partners. So funny, just yesterday— and for the past few days, I've been talking about how the chaos in the House is, gives democracy a bad name globally, and that is a feature and not a bug. This letter was signed by 11 minority party members on the committee. It was not immediately clear whether Biden's administration, uh, which has recently conducted classified sessions for lawmakers about the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, that it's not clear if they're going to schedule a briefing on China. This is Representative Raja Krishnamurthy of Illinois, top Democrat on the panel, and he said the need for a briefing would not be obviated if Republicans are able to settle on a new Speaker of the House this week. I don't think they will. Quote, we have no assurances that the Republican-led majority in the House will work in a bipartisan fashion to avoid a government shutdown on November 17th, he said. We need this briefing to show members of this body how the current political dysfunction harms our national security interests. Again, we've been saying this. We've been saying this for days and days and days, actually a few weeks now. At first, the, the chaos in the house was just like, get your popcorn, let's watch them tear each other apart. But, you know, it's it's becoming more clear that this is the this is the goal of House Republicans, at least some of them, is to cause this chaos and to make democracy, uh, give democracy a bad name. And uh, we need to find out how our adversaries, especially the autocracies, are exploiting that. It's been nearly three weeks since the House, uh, prodded by a handful of breakaway Republicans, voted to oust Kevin McCarthy as the Speaker. In succession, Reps Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan failed to collect the votes needed. And House Republicans are meeting today, Monday, to hear from a new roster of candidates. And it just looks like another shit show. The Democratic lawmakers asked Haynes and Burns to address a 10-point series of questions that boil down to what the intelligence community knows about China's messaging, whether it represents a threat to U.S. interests, and whether foreign adversaries have altered their thinking about American national security because of recent events in Congress. We already know the Chinese Communist Party is working to capitalize on our chaos. And they go on to say Vladimir Putin and President Xi Jinping had lengthy meetings this past week. So Congress needs to understand how our leadership vacuum is hurting us on the world stage. And next up from Axios, former President Trump allegedly shared sensitive information with his Mar-a-Lago member friend Anthony Pratt, that's the Australian cardboard guy, on calls he had with leaders of Iraq and Ukraine. And that's according to audio leaked to Australian media. Australian billionaire Pratt is one of 84 potential witnesses that federal prosecutors have identified in Trump's classified documents trial, which is scheduled to begin in Florida in May. Trump denied the reports late Sunday. The New York Times previously reported that Republican presidential nomination frontrunner Trump leaked classified information about U.S. nuclear submarines to Pratt. We've heard about that. And Pratt described Trump's business practices of being like the mafia, according to audio from the joint investigation by Australian 60 Minutes, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, which The New York Times also obtained. Quote, it hadn't even been on the news yet. And he, Trump, said, so I just bombed Iraq today. And that's what the... Uh, Pratt said, the global executive chair of VC Industries and Pratt Industries. That's one of the conversations in 2019, per the leaked audio. Quote, and the president of Iraq called me up and said, you just leveled my city. And he said, I said, OK, what are you going to do about it? This is Trump talking about phone calls with world leaders that he just bombed to Anthony Pratt. Pratt allegedly described Trump in other audio excerpts as outrageous with a love of shocking people and knowing exactly what to say and what not to say so that he avoids jail. But he gets so close to it that it looks to everyone like he's breaking the law. Now, the audio also appears to show Pratt recounting Trump describing to him the 2019 call he had with President Zelensky that helped lead to his first impeachment, in which Trump argued 
that Zelensky needed to investigate Biden and his family for unsubstantiated claims of corruption in the country. Trump said, you know what, the, that Ukraine phone call, that was nothing compared to what I usually do. That Ukraine phone call, that's nothing. That's nothing like what I usually talk about. And that's according to the audio. Now, former Trump National Security Advisor John Bolton called the former president's reported comments on Iraq potentially dangerous due to possible operational reasons. Quote, Trump doesn't have a filter between his brain and his mouth. That's what Bolton told the Australian 60 Minutes. And so the concern that he would reveal classified information to a foreigner or even an ally, but a private citizen, struck many people as entirely believable, unquote. While not directly addressing the Australian media reports, Trump said in a statement to The New York Times earlier Sunday that Pratt is from a friendly country. It's Australia, one of our great allies. I don't know him well, but he seemed like a nice person. He built a factory in Ohio and created American jobs. But then later he called him a crazy red-haired person. He called him the weird, the weirdo redhead. And the True Social Post on late Sunday that did not address the Australian media reports, Trump said the Times had not called him for comment. He described the story about his red-haired weirdo friend from Australia named Anthony Pratt. He said it was leaked by special counsel Jack Smith and the DOJ as fake news. And Trump added he did not speak to Pratt about submarines, but they did discuss creating jobs in Ohio and Pennsylvania because that's what I'm all about. Representatives for Pratt did not immediately respond to Axios's request for comment. And we know Jack Smith has questioned this Pratt fellow. And today on Yacht Cops, the Justice Department on Monday officially moved to claim a 340-foot super yacht. It says belongs to a sanctioned billionaire oligarch known as the Russian Gatsby. In a civil forfeiture claim filed in New York federal court, U.S. Attorney Damian Williams, he said the $300 million vessel, the Amadea, is beneficially owned by Suleiman Karamov and that the super yacht was improved and maintained in violation of applicable sanctions against Karamov and those acting on his behalf. The filing contends that the yacht, which, by the way, has a helipad, an infinity pool, a jacuzzi, multiple bars, we call it a Russian nesting yacht, it should be forfeited to the U.S. government. And that's what the filing says. Now, Karamov, who's worth an estimated $14 billion and has ties to the Russian government, was sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury over alleged money laundering in 2018. He's been referred to as the Russian Gatsby, in part because he rarely does interviews while indulging in the high life. He's hosted multi-million dollar parties at his villas on the French Riviera, including one in 2008 that reportedly featured a performance by Beyonce. And his car collection includes a rare Ferrari Enzo, which he once crashed into a tree in 2006. The yacht was seized in Fiji last year as part of the work of the Justice Department's task force Klepto Capture. I call them yacht cops which has been going on after the assets of sanctioned oligarchs in the wake of Russia's 2022 invasion of Ukraine. We've been seizing them, selling them, giving them, giving the assets over to Ukraine. The court filing said officials were able to prove Karamov's ownership of the yacht by showing he was responsible for numerous upgrades. However, another oligarch, Edward Kudianatov, maintains he's the owner of the Amadea, and he has filed legal challenges for its return. Now, Kudianatov is the former chairman and CEO of Rosneft, the state-controlled gas company in Russia, and he's not been sanctioned by the U.S. government. The Justice Department has said in court filings that Kudayanatov is, is a straw owner. He's not the real owner. He couldn't even afford the upkeep on the Amadea and another super yacht that he says he owns. So he's just the straw man. So trying to keep the assets away from the government because the, the actual guy who owns the yacht is sanctioned. And last but not least, cool science news. I know we don't do it that often, but we've had a couple of really cool scientific things happen in the last couple of weeks. This is CNN reporting. Astronomers have detected a mysterious blast of radio waves that have taken 8 billion years to reach Earth. The fast radio burst is one of the most distant and energetic ever observed. Fast radio bursts are intense millisecond long bursts of radio waves with unknown origins. The first FRB was discovered in 2007, and since then, hundreds of these quick cosmic flashes have been detected, coming from distant points across the universe. This burst, named FRB 2022-0610A, lasted less than a millisecond. But in that fraction of a moment, it released the equivalent of our sun's energetic emissions over the course of 30 years. That's according to a study published Thursday in the journal Science. Many FRBs release super bright radio waves lasting only a few milliseconds at most before disappearing, which makes fast radio bursts difficult to observe. Radio telescopes have helped astronomers trace these quick cosmic flashes. 
including the uh, ASCAP array of radio telescopes located on, oh gosh, what, it's, it's in Western Australia, let's just say that. Astronomers used ASCAP to detect the FRB in June of 2022 and to determine where it originated. I don't know how you would even de- begin to determine where it originated. Uh, using ASCAP's array of radio dishes, we were able to determine precisely where it came from. This is a Dr. Stuart Ryder, co-author of the study, an astronomer at uh, the university, the, the Macquarie University in Australia. Then we used the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope in Chile to search for the source galaxy, finding it to be older and farther away than any other FRB source found to date and likely within a small group of merging galaxies. The research team traced the burst to what appears to be a group of two or three galaxies that are in the process of merging, interacting, and forming new stars. This finding aligns with current theories that suggest fast radio bursts may come from magnetars, or highly energetic objects that result from the explosion of stars. So that all makes sense. All very cool. Uh, Astronomers said they hope the future radio telescopes currently under construction in South Africa and Australia will be able to uh, detect thousands more fast radio bursts at greater, even greater distances. So mm, interesting and exciting. Eight billion light years away. Dang. All right. We have the good news. But first, my conversation with my friend, the Palm Beach County State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg. That's going to happen right after the break. Stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm honored to be joined today by my friend, amazing fellow. He is the Palm Beach County DA. Please welcome Dave Ehrenberg. Hey, Dave. Great to be back with you, Allison. Love the show. I love having you on the show. We always have the best discussions. They get super technical and in-depth, and I learn so much when you're here. And so I'm so glad that you're joining me today on Dana's Week Off. Let's talk about, I need to know, I have to know, these about these you know these plea deals that went down in uh, in Georgia because everybody on the right is saying that this proves that Fonnie Willis has a weak case and that you know she's got nothing I, I don't I don't feel like that's correct so so help us out here why who benefits from these plea deals well first off you said that when I come on the discussions are super technical so before anyone shuts off their dial she means super technically interesting. That's what that's what you mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> but as far as uh, the uh, the plea deals, like as a prosecutor, we do this thing all the time where you give the first ones the best deal. There's an adage amongst local criminal defense lawyers: first in, first to win. The first one in the prosecutor's door gets the best deal. And although Sidney uh, Powell was not the first defendant to flip that Scott Hall, the bail bondsman in Atlanta. It's uh, it's still the biggest name to flip, the first big name. And she can help provide the goods against Jeff Clark because there's a conspiracy there where she and Scott Hall were are both tied through each other to Clark. And, and so he's in a lot of trouble. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, I think, could be a lot of trouble with her flipping – They were both lawyers for Trump together. Don't listen to what Trump and Giuliani say now that they barely know her. She's the coffee girl. So she could be helpful. But (laughs) I know there are people saying, hey, she tried to overturn our democracy. She needs to serve prison time. But look, she's a first time offender, number one. Number two, although and so she may not even qualify for prison time. She may not score prison time by the time this case is over and if she's found guilty at trial. So cutting her a deal early on where she gets probation and she has to testify is really not bad. Plus, it means it's more likely that she will have to cooperate with Jack Smith because anything she says in Atlanta can be used by Jack Smith's election interference case against her in D.C., and she's an unindicted co-conspirator there. So she's not out of the woods yet. Plus, even though she won't be serving prison time in Georgia, she's got two major defamation cases out there that's going to bankrupt her. She's got possible disbarment because of this plea deal. And you know, to tell the truth, Allison, about Sidney Powell, look, she's she's a nutty individual. I mean, and and really the stuff she came up with her ridiculous conspiracy theories about Hugo Chavez's ghost and all that other garbage. But she seemed to be more the front person, the person out front who spewed the crazy, where in reality, the people in, in the behind the scenes seem to be more dangerous. You know, the uh, the 
the Clark and the the Chesbro, the Eastmans, they seem more dangerous. Whereas City Pals seem to be the front person who gets all the show but none of the go. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. And yeah, this does implicate her up in the federal Jack Smith investigation. And I tell you, the feds don't plead felonies down to misdemeanors like uh, the state courts do. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of a corner she's painted herself into there. And also with her defamation suits, particularly with the voting machines, because that is what she is going to have to give her proffer about and probably are at the, actually already has. And I have a consideration question for you as prosecutors. In a big RICO case like this, had these speedy trials gone ahead this week, the prosecution would have to show their entire case, right? And not just the case against these two folks, because in a RICO case, you have to present your whole case because everyone is part of the same, you know, criminal enterprise, and they're all guilty of each other's crimes. Uh, basically, they're all responsible for what everybody else did. We had this discussion, you and I. In fact, that's when I first asked you about that. Like, would it be different for these folks? And you're like, nope, it's all the same. And and that was like a big aha moment for me about the nature of racketeering. Is it a consideration? You know, if I'm the prosecutor and I'm like, if we, first of all, Hall and his plea agreement tanked, like gave them Sidney Powell dead to rights. And then probably Clark, too. We might see a Clark cooperation deal happen here pretty soon if she's willing to hand one out. And then Powell, after she pled... The cheese stood alone, right? <laughs> Chesbro's like, I don't want to go on this the trial by myself. But they offered them good deals to, is it a consideration to offer somebody a good deal to get rid of that speedy trial so that you don't have to present your case to the entire group of other defendants who aren't scheduled to go yet to give them a leg up to prepare for their defense when their trial comes to, to pass? It's such a good point. This is another reason why it was in... Fonnie Willis's interest to cut the deal early with Sidney Powell and Cheesebro. I, I've never understood whether it's Cheesebro or Chessbro, but whichever. I mean, I guess Cheesebro, so it's, it's a funnier name. So we'll go with that. But the reason why she really wanted to go and settle this early on, among other reasons, I think the major reason is if they went to trial, they'd be going to trial first. They both invoke Speedy and they would be tried and Donald Trump and the bigger players would get a dress rehearsal for free. They'd get to watch the state's case and learn from it. Now, Trump is going to go blind. Uh, he's not watching anyone else go before him. He's not going to gain that advantage. So this plea deal hurts Trump. Also, it makes it more likely that Trump could be tried before the election because these trials take months. And if Cheesebro and... Uh, Sidney Powell were tried first, combined in their own case, it would be like a four or five month trial. So there'd be no chance that Trump and his cohorts would be tried before the election. But now they're out of the way. And yes, you can now see that Trump and the others could face trial before the election. And that's got to scare him to death. Yeah. And another question for you. Mark Meadows had filed, uh, you know, a motion to have his uh, his uh his business removed to federal court uh, instead of the state court. And then they put an expedited schedule on that because of the pressure of the speedy trial. And once that pressure of the speedy trial for him was off because he said he wasn't going to try to do a speedy trial, he then the, uh, the 11th Circuit said, oh, slow down. You know, we can go a little bit slower on, on Meadows' appeal. Is it possible now that there is no speedy trial for D.A. Fonny Willis to file a reconsideration for an expedited appeal so that that Meadows thing can get worked out in case the the trial for the remaining 16 defendants is, may possibly moved up a little bit. Wow, that, that is a really good point. Hadn't thought about it. And I think the answer is yes. I still don't think the Meadows thing is going to slow things down too much because the 11th Circuit and the Supreme Court know what's going on here. They don't want to be used by these guys. Plus, I don't think Meadows has a really good case there. I think they're going to reject him. And so I, I don't. Oh, yeah. They just want him to do him sooner rather than later. You know. Yeah. No, I hear you. And I think the answer is yes, she could. That, that They could ask for um, an expedited hearing because of that. But I don't think it matters too much. I think they're going to get through it fairly quickly. And I don't think that's going to keep these cases from being heard before the election. Other things could, but I don't think that will. 
Well, couldn't um, Judge McAfee himself, I mean, if he wanted to, just sue Esponte, sort of set up a little bit of a, a schedule for the rest of the 16 defendants now that we don't have the speedy trial? Or do, do briefings have to happen for that? Because I, I think he can do that, sue Esponte. And he's been actually really phenomenal at making decisions from the bench on the fly. Unlike, you know, we see with Judge Aileen Cannon, who can't, you know, tie her shoe without six months of <laughs> and 14 briefings and some SEPA conferences. He's been really uh, flexible and, and kind of on it. So is he allowed to just sue a Does a court have that inherent power to just go ahead and try to set up at least preliminary pretrial motions and schedules and stuff like that? In a case like this, that's such a high profile case with so many defendants. I think he's going to want the input of the uh, the sides. I don't think he's going to do a sua sponte, meaning... On his own. That's one of those fancy Latin terms. So I think he is less likely to do that on his own. But I do think that uh, you'll see. You could ask for those briefings, though, right? Well, yes. And I think Fonnie Willis is going to push for it now. I think Fonnie Willis is going to say, look, we got these two early ones out of the way. The speedy's out of the way. Let's now have an expedited calendar for the rest of them. I think that's coming. And I I think that uh, the judge will be amenable to that. He's been really good. And it shows you just because he's a newbie on the bench. He hasn't been starry-eyed. He hasn't just uh, given in to all the delays. Judge Cannon is pretty new to the bench, and she has slow walked this case, where I think the strongest case of them all, the Mar-a-Lago documents case, is the least likely, in my mind, to be tried before the election. And uh, so Donald Trump uh, lucked out when he pulled Judge Cannon in that federal case, uh, but he wanted uh, Judge McAfee in Atlanta. You know how I know he wanted him, right? Because he decided not to seek federal removal. He didn't want Judge Jones, federal judge appointed by President Obama. He wanted Judge McAfee, a Federalist Society member appointed by Brian Kemp. And yet Judge McAfee has proven to be up for the task. That and he also didn't immediately started attacking, immediately start attacking Judge McAfee uh, as he has with his other judges. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, Judge Cannon. I like your thoughts on what happened with the Garcia hearings. Those are conflicts of interest hearings. As everybody knows who listens to the Jack podcast, Walt Nauda and his lawyer, Stanley Woodward, had some conflicts with UCL Tavares because Woodward used to represent Tavares. And in fact, the minute Woodward stopped representing Tavares, Tavares, you know, changed his uh, testimony and and uh, there was a superseding indictment that followed from his testimony. And then we have John Irving, the, the, these are both Trump paid attorneys, by the way, paid by his PAC, uh, representing um, uh, the other guy, Dale Oliveira. And Dale Oliveira got to keep his lawyer. He, he argued he didn't, have, he didn't care about the conflicts of interest. And then there was some stuff about uh, Walt Nauta that, you know, got a postponement. But it, it seemed like this judge, Judge Aileen Cannon, was not hip to allowing alternative advice counsel to come in and advise these two fellows. Uh, which I thought was weird because Judge Boesberg in D.C. did. And that's what we that's what landed us witness number four, which was UCL Tavares. As soon as he talked to that public defender, he's like, oh, I'm out. I'm out. Now, I guess because they went through the colloquy and asked if they understood and they said yes, and then they waived their conflict. I guess that sort of erases the ability for them to appeal uh, later on if they get convicted, you know, the defendants. But the thing that struck me was that De Oliveira was not able to articulate in his own words what that meant, but the judge approved it anyway. And I was wondering if that leaves a, a, a door open for them to appeal later. Good, but she went through the whole colloquy, meaning she asked them all the questions to make sure they knew what they were getting into. The difference here, Allison, is what you identified is that in the case of Tavares, who said, I want out, I want my own lawyer, he was able to speak to a public defender. Here, the two, De Oliveira and Nada, uh, they weren't speaking to anyone else. They were just asked the questions by the judge. And they were asked the questions in front of all the lawyers and in front of you know Trump's people. And so they knew the eyes were on them. And Trump's people are paying for their lawyer's and it's very different than when you're in a private room with your own lawyer who has your own interests at heart. Here, the judge is asking the questions, are you OK with this? This is a potential conflict. And they said, yeah, we're fine, fine, fine. And I hear you when you say De Oliveira didn't totally perhaps understand what's going on, but her, his answers were good enough for Judge Cannon. 
And because of that, I don't think there's a real chance that any future conviction of them will be overturned. I think it's just bad news for them that they are going to face prison time rather than do uh, what Cassie Hutchinson did, which is get her own lawyer and escape any uh, potential incarceration, in fact, become a, a, a hero to many. Instead, they're following the Alan Weisselberg model, which is go down with the ship, go to Rikers if necessary, and hope that Trump will take care of you afterwards. Yeah, I, except I would imagine they're looking at their buddy, you know, Tavares and saying, oh, he's not in jail. And, you know, if I were De Oliveira's defense attorney uh, and I got convicted, I might file a complaint saying about the judge saying she didn't allow the DOJ's request for alternate lawyers to come in and talk to me. That seems like my rights were trampled upon or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. It just didn't seem, you know, every it didn't seem like it got the thread tied off completely for me, um, if that makes any sense. Well, it, you know, the Oliveira didn't ask for his uh, a separate lawyer to talk to. And this was the DOJ who said, hey, let him talk to other people. And really, there's no requirement that they are able to talk to others. It, the Oliveira didn't want it. He's like, no, I'm good. I want to stay with yeah, you. Yeah, DOJ did their due diligence. They asked. Right. And that's the thing. They, they tried to get it. So DOJ shouldn't be penalized later on by having their conviction overturned because they tried. Mm. So I think that if the Oliveira and not are convicted, I think they will be, then uh, they're going to go down. Yeah, they. I think they definitely will be. And and I wonder, you know, even if there's a chance now for, for any kind of cooperation deal, because let's end, let's end this discussion over here. You know, let's go back to Georgia. Why do you think... Uh, Sidney Powell was able to get her felonies turned into misdemeanors, but Chesbro had to plead to a felony. Is it because he was because he was number two? Yeah, I think uh, Chesbro slash Cheesebro, I think he was more culpable. And I think it goes to the fact that, first off, Chesbro rejected the plea deal originally, and then Sidney Powell accepted it. And so the Chesbro got the FOMO and was like... <laughs> Fear he got the FOMO. He got the FOMO. The, the cheese got the FOMO, and he then wanted in. And by that point, the prosecutor's like, "Hey, you could have gone, gotten the misdemeanors, but now you're gonna have to cop to the felony." But also, I think it's because Cheesebro was the guy who was like really plotting the coup from within the the fake elector scheme, where Sidney Powell is just the the doofus who's just doing the stuff like in front of the cameras. Um, also. This is the, the Cheeseboro thing is going to really, I think, hurt Jeffrey Clark. To go back to that for one second. Do you know that in the federal indictment, Jack Smith's federal indictment in D.C., it's alleged that Hall, Scott Hall, spoke with Jeff Clark for 63 minutes about the election in early January 2021. And then uh, Jack Smith said it was in furtherance of the conspiracy. So you've got Hall now uh, attached to Clark. And what was Hall accused of? Well, tampering with the voting machines. So he is speaking with Clark for 63 minutes, probably about tampering with voting machines. And now you've got Sidney Powell, who is pleading guilty to six misdemeanors for tampering with the voting machines. So Clark is in so much trouble. I expect he needs to. Well, not only that, but right after that phone call, Dave, right after that 63 minute phone call, that's when Clark penned his letter to Georgia. Exactly. Exactly. So so that's why Clark, I think, is is the biggest loser here. I think another huge loser, of course, is Trump because he doesn't get a dress rehearsal of the trial. And now it's more likely that it will go before the election than before. And Rudy Giuliani, too, because Giuliani was standing there with Sidney Powell with his hair dye dripping, talking about these conspiracy theories. And so his co-counsel is going down. And I just think he, he's going to be next. But I wonder who the last person on the sinking ship will be. I I, I would be surprised if Rudy Giuliani ever, ever cops a uh, plea. I mean, look, he accepted money from Trump for his legal defense fund. Uh, they did a fundraiser at Mar-a-Lago, I think, or Bedminster. It was at Bedminster. And they said they raised a million dollars for Rudy, but that was uh, their own uh, PR. I don't know if that ever happened. I don't know if they really raised a million or if that was like in a million lira or something. I don't know, but probably not dollars. <laughs> the FOMO thing cracks me up, though. FOMO cheese, uh, the FOMO fromage, uh, if you will. I think that that's I think that's the best way to put I it. I wish I came up with that one first. FOMO fromage. That should be the title <laughs> for this podcast, please. <laughs> I've written it down already, my friend. 
<laughs> awesome. Yeah, we'll see what ends up happening. I know Clark is going to be in, in, a, in deep trouble. And it will be interesting to see how far up the ladder the DA goes with uh, with plea deals before she starts putting people in jail on deals because the, the no jail time isn't going to last long, if at all, much longer, uh, especially in this particular spoke of the hub and spoke conspiracy. Thank you so much for your time today. It's always, always a, like such a pleasure to talk to you. I always learn so much uh, and I really enjoy it. Everybody follow at Ehrenberg. It's A-R-O-N-B-E-R-G, I believe over on the socials and uh and uh you know really respect the work you're doing down there in, in palm beach county hey, allison thank you so much for having me on and if you follow me on twitter i will not call it by the current name it's at Ehrenberg. on threads it's at dave Ehrenberg. instagram at dave Ehrenberg. and i started a new youtube page at florida lawman florida lawman florida lawman i like it instead of florida man it's you got to get the law in there yeah, Dave Ehrenberg's Law Blog. I, I'm really into it. Uh, so check that out, YouTube channel, because, you know, we only do audio here, so you get to see your lovely face on YouTube. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thanks so much, Dave. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, you want to play what the mutt, find the cat, uh, opine on the bovine, what the heck wine, anything you want to play, any of those fun games, you want to send us frog orgies or baby pictures, I will send them, I will forward the baby pictures to Dana. I did for the one yesterday. Shout out to a loved one, shout out to yourself, small business in your area, adoptable pet in your area if you can't pay pod pet tax, anything you want to send us at all, especially those thesis and dissertation titles are awesome. You can do it by going to dailybeanspod.com and clicking on contact. First up, from Anna Marie, pronouns she and her, Dear Leguminati, I have loved hearing about the wonderful scouting experiences of listener Laura and of AG on the episode Differently Victorious, so I wanted to share mine too. I was a campfire girl, very similar to Girl Scouts, and went to horse camp every year. It was called Camp Wallahi. And uh, it was in the mountains near Julian in San Diego County. My favorite thing about it, besides riding horses, was the wood fairy. She was said to live inside a hollow place in a specific tree on camp property. No one ever saw her, of course, but, you know, if you wrote her a letter and placed it in the opening of her hollow, she would write an answering letter, usually by the next day. The coolest thing was that her letters were always written backwards, so you could read them uh, if you held them up to a mirror and her answers to our curious questions were always creative and surprising. She answered every letter we wrote. I wrote her so many times I was soon able to read backwards writing. This went on year after year, and when I got older and became a junior counselor, I got to be the wood fairy and answer the letters for the young kids. It, I loved giving them the same fun experiences I treasured. I can still write backwards and upside down to this day, which really impresses my students now that I'm a teacher. I love those formative childhood experiences that make us the interesting adults we are now. I hope to hear more of them in the good news. For tax, I'm including a photo of my sister and me with the San Diego chicken. Ah, yes, the recognizable 1970s mascot for local sports team or TV station, which was published in the San Diego Tribune to announce the peanut and candy fundraiser that sent lots of campfire kids to camp each year. I am the kid on the left. As always, The Daily Beans is important to my mornings, like a balanced, healthy breakfast for the mind and soul. Thanks for all you do. Absolutely wonderful. I'm, I'm, I totally remember the San Diego chicken, by the way. I 100% remember the chicken. And yeah, th that I we didn't have a wood fairy, but we did have a counselor hunt where, the you know, right at dusk, the counselors would hide and they were each worth a certain amount of points. And I spent years and years finding the counselors. And then when I finally got to hide, it was a very, a very cool special day. So very cool. Thank you for sending that in. Next up from Juan, pronouns he and him in an AG voice. Hello. Good news. After a couple of decades in the architecture world, I've decided to pursue my two passions. One, as a stay-at-home dad to the two most amazing humans I know. And two, opening my own photography business based right outside of Philadelphia. 
It is Juan Ramos Photo. That's J U A N R A M O S Photo, P H O T O dot com. Ra- uh, Juan Ramos Photo. AG and DG, if you're ever in the area, I would love to gift you a photo shoot to celebrate your awesomeness and thanks for the work that you do. Shout out to my amazing wife for making those things possible and making the world a better place. Oh, look at these babies. I got to send the baby picture to Dana. Oh, my God. Oh, these photos are incredible. Zara, our West Siberian uh, Leica, I guess, for pet tax. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. My Amazing Girls and a photo at the January 2017 protests in Philadelphia. Yeah, I'll let you know, Juan, if we're coming to Philadelphia. I think we might be next summer. I'll keep you posted. Next up from Amanda, pronounce she and her. Hi, Beans Queens. Girl with the Susie Sue tattoo chiming in with a shout out and a cute story. I recently started my hairstyle and makeup artistry business here in Portland, Oregon. Fucking cool. Uh, A new client was referred to me from a friend client of mine. She came in and we immediately hit it off. And through our chat, she told me she listened to the Daily Beans. We're so excited to be mutual friends of the podcast. If any PDX friends of the pod need a fresh style, hit me up at pipdx. Okay, I'm just going to spell it out because I don't want to pronounce anything wrong here. It's P-I-P-P-D-X-M-U-A-A-F on Instagram. Thanks for all you do. I will stop by and say hello to you the next time I am in Portland. Amanda, I want to see your amazing Susie tattoo. You should send a photo. Susie, 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 Sue and the Banshees. Um, One of my favorite bands growing up. What's my favorite song? <sighs> Let's see. I mean, I love them all, but I think the one I probably played the most was Peekaboo because it came out when I was like right around that sixth, seventh grade time. All right, next up from Garden Lady. Hey, Beans Queens, thanks for all you do. It's been tough, and this community really helps lift us up. So thank, thank you for that. My pod pet tax, I give you our babies, Leah and Max, German Shepherd dogs, and the best ones ever. Oh, my God, they're so cute. They're so very different looking, especially with the ears. Both very beautiful babies, though. Thank you for sending that. Next up, Cheryl, pronouns she and her. I want to congratulate my beautiful granddaughter, Uh, And her partner, they got married Saturday, and it was so beautiful. Here is an absolutely gorgeous picture. Oh, they both look so amazing. Oh, that's so great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I needed that little heart lift. Next up from Dinosaur Dave, pronouns he and him. Greetings, beans, queens. It's the dinosaur nerd from Australia again. Hello. This one's a bit of a mixed bag. I have been made redundant from the company I have worked for for almost 16 years. I've known this was coming for almost five years, but it's still a bit surreal to be unemployed. That said, I was given a semi-decent sized redundancy payout, so I'm using it to go on a round Australia road trip. I'm hoping to see all the things I've wanted to see for years. Starting near Sydney, I'm going south through Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia, north to Darwin, then to complete the loop via Townsville, and south back to where I started. I'm also using the time to work on an educational book series. Oh, very cool. Since I'll be visiting a lot of the sites I've wanted to visit for that book anyway. Two birds, one stone. And it's all tax deductible. Do it to it being business related. Ha ha. I look forward to waking up from my little camper somewhere in this massive country, listening to the batshit fuckery that is the USA via (laughs) you 2 Overall, I view it as a positive as getting out of here will open up a lot of new opportunities in the long run. But first up, helping my elderly grandparents live their best golden years. For a shout out, I would love to shout out Brick Resales in Brisbane. It's a secondhand Lego store that helps a lot of local charities with toy donations throughout throughout the year. If you like Lego and you're near Brisbane, check it out. Judy and Greg are the best and they deserve all the love that they can get. Attached is some of the amazing Lego builds in their store. Keep up the good work. And remember, if you make one random person smile every day, the world is a brighter place. Ah, so true. Thank you so much, Dinosaur Dave. I can't wait for the road pictures. I really, I want updates from the road. Look at these great builds. That's so awesome. Millennium Falcon action. We got a Pride Lego build. These are so great. Thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna with, let me repeat that business again. Do 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 do. Educational two birds. Brick resales. Brick resales in Brisbane. Thank you so much, and thanks to everybody for your good news submissions today. 
Uh, I feel so much better. Uh, these are lovely photos. Everything is just like super uplifting. I really appreciate it. I needed it today. Um, and I, again, I want, I want a photo of the Susie Sue tattoo. Um, need to see that one. Um, send it to us and send all your good news to us at dailybeanspod.com. Just click on contact. You know, I'll be back in your ears tomorrow. Who do I have coming in tomorrow as a guest? Let's see. Let's look at the old calendar, shall we? Today is October. Doo -doo -doo. We've got John Fugel saying tomorrow. So I'm very excited about that. Um, you can listen to his Sirius XM Progress radio show um, called Tell Me Everything. So very excited to speak to him. All right, everybody, we will be back in your ears tomorrow. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Take care of your family. Vote blue over Q, Ohio, Virginia, and bring everyone with you. I've been A.G., and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. <laughs>